Can I welcome everyone to the 15th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is a decision on whether to take Agenda Item 3 in private. Is everyone content that Agenda Item 3 is taken in private? Thank you. The next item of business is an evidence session on widening access. The committee has previously undertaken a visit to the Royal Conservatoire to discuss widening access with a number of higher education institutions. It's also taken evidence from the Commission for Fair Access and the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science. And can I welcome to this meeting Professor Sir Ian Diamond, Principal and Vice-Chancellor, University of Aberdeen. Professor Craig Mahoney, Principal and Vice-Chancellor, University of the West of Scotland. Professor Geoffrey Sharkey, Principal Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Alistair Sim, Director, University Scotland. And Susan Stewart, Director of the Open Universities in Scotland. Before I invite questions from my colleagues, I'd like to invite Alistair Sim to make a brief opening statement, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to give evidence today and to make an opening statement. Um, every leader of a Scottish higher education institution is thoroughly committed to wide access to higher education. This is a value that is intrinsic to Scottish higher education and we welcome the high cross-party priority that politicians have given it. The Commission on Widening Access set a new level of challenge for all parts of the education system, with a vision for equal access to higher education um, that the Fair Access Commissioner described in his annual report as among the most ambitious in the world. And we are rising to our part of that challenge. In November 2017, University of Scotland published Working to Widen Access, setting out our programme of action to take forward the Commissioner's recommend recommendations. This includes a review, nationally and institutionally, of admissions policy and practice, and institutions are examining the entrance requirements for every single course to set minimum entry requirements that open these courses to people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds who have the ability to succeed. Each institution is also re-examining its contextual admissions policy to ensure that candidates from disadvantaged backgrounds whose exam results may not reflect their full potential, are given special consideration. We're also looking at widening the categories of applicant given special consideration by all institutions, for instance, to include learners eligible for free school meals or education maintenance allowance. Articulation from college to university can be a powerful tool for widening access, and already the majority of people who continue in the same subject area from college to university get full credit for their, co their college achievements. Every institution is considering how to drive this further. We've also set up a joint project with Colleges Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council to break down any national level barriers, for instance, to examine how to achieve better curricular match between higher national qualifications and university in subjects where people from college are not currently getting full credit. Importantly, we're also looking at the language we use to communicate about admissions policy and practice, and we'll work with learners and their advisors on that. At the moment, it can be precise but opaque and varies between institutions. We want to create clear and consistent language about admissions. All our actions need to support true lifelong learning. We're pleased that the Commissioner and the Scottish Government have recognised that mature learners are included within the Commission on Widening Access's targets. We also need to ensure that part-time learners, many of them from disadvantaged backgrounds and with demanding care responsibilities, are seen as core to wide access. Our written evidence summarises progress. We are already closing in on a target that at least 16% of entrants should come from the 20% most deprived backgrounds. 14.8% of entrants came from SIMD 20 areas in 2015-16. All our diverse institutions are pulling their weight, and if you apply to university from an SIMD 20 background, you are now as likely to get offered a place as your more privileged peers. Full achievement of our national ambitions on wide access will require joined up action across government and multiple levels of education. For instance, we need to measure success intelligently, recognising that the majority of income deprived people live outside the most deprived areas as measured by SAMD. We need to ensure that as we widen access for the most socioeconomically deprived, we don't lose sight of the need to be fair to learners from all other backgrounds, many of whom have their own challenges. And as the Commissioner noted, the critical issue is to increase qualified applicants from deprived backgrounds. There's still a stark poverty-related attainment gap. The latest information we have from the Scottish Government shows only 20% of school leavers from the most deprived decile, with three or more hires or equivalent, compared to 70% of the most privileged school leavers. 
We're pleased that the Commissioner intends now to look at how schools can contribute to the national ambitions, and we will welcome this committee's insight into how government, schools, colleges and the university sector can best meet these shared ambitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Sum. Um, Liz, you've got a question. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, I wonder if I could concentrate uh, on the um, ability of schools to be part of this widening access process. We're living in an age where, obviously, it is increasingly difficult for domiciled Scots to get a place at university because of the fact that the demand so exceeds the, the, the supply in the CAP system. That then determines that the school qualifications that they have are exceptionally important, particularly for those who come from deprived backgrounds. And we've seen evidence uh, last week from Professor Jim Scott um, that there is a diminishing number uh, of advanced higher courses that are being offered to those from deprived backgrounds. And we're also seeing that of the 360 schools that he did an investigation into, over half of them have reduced their subject choice uh, in S4. That is a very serious problem. Would the panel be able to give their views on how we can address this, particularly for those students from the disadvantaged backgrounds for whom we want to raise aspiration? It's fine in terms of raising that aspiration, but only if we can give them the facility to undertake the courses that they need. So I'll, I'll answer briefly, um, and um, I think um, colleagues may have um, experience, for instance, on, on supply people doing music at school that, that they, they may wish to draw on. Um, I mean, I think this really does have to be a whole system um, effort. I think if I would say briefly on advanced hires, um, universities are, are very conscious that the availability of advanced hires is, is patchy across the education system. Um, now, there are things that universities are doing to, to, to assist that, for instance, advanced hire hubs, um, for instance, al allowing um, access to, um, to university facilities for, for people studying advanced hire. Um, there are initiatives in the country of, of joint work between school, college and university to increase the availability of advanced hire. But nonetheless, it's still patchy, which is why um, really uh, the offers that universities make to um, candidates are, are, are principally based on hire um, because of the uh, limits on available advanced hire and, and, and the fact that advanced hire availability tends to be concentrated in the most privileged areas. Um, I think on a subject choice, I mean, you know, this has been a matter of, of significant debate and we are, you know, we, we, we are reliant um, on people coming up through the school system um, with a sufficient range of, of, of qualifications to enable them to get into the most selective courses. Of course, there are discontinuities. For instance, if you're coming into um, to university, say, to study ancient history or whatever, you may not be required to have a lot of um, prior experience of that at school because there just isn't very much of it at school. So, um, I think we do our best to, to, to meet learners where they are, but nonetheless we are reliant on a supply chain of people with a, a reasonably wide range of qualifications at school level. Uh, pursue that line, Mr Sim, because the advanced hire is seen as Scotland's best qualification by many educationalists, not just in Scotland, but internationally and south of the border. And therefore it's absolutely vital that the access to that advanced hire... Uh, particularly in some schools that may, may actually be in rural areas who can't take advantage of the hubs, are able to uh, develop their courses so that the youngsters who are wanting to attract to university but who currently don't have the choice are able to do so. Would you acknowledge that we have to do much more at the school level to ensure that these qualifications are readily available to all pupils who we f feel have the potential to be able to do the advanced hire and therefore obviously to improve their uh, admissions uh, to university. I think that would be great. Um, when you respond, can I just ask, mm. and I should have said before, uh, Liz started the question, can I ask both that we make the questions short and the answers as succinct as possible, because we do have a lot to get through today. Uh, I mean, I think that would be great. I think that's acknowledged also in the Scottish Government's Learner Journey report last week, which um, identified wider, availabil wider availability of advanced hires as something to, to work for. Um, my sorry, sorry. I mentioned the Young Applicants in Secondary Schools programme, which uh, is run by Open University and uh, has been going for 10 years. This year we've got 1,100 six-year students throughout Scotland who are taking the uh, YAS programme, and it really is Scotland's only nation nationwide school-to-university 
bridging programme. Um, it's not an alternative to advanced hires, but it is a, a widening access initiative. Okay. Which um, my final question is to Professor Sharkey. When we visited the Royal Conservatoire, uh, you made a very interesting point about uh, the Conservatoire's 100% commitment to widening access into diversity. Um, but you said specifically that in schools, um, there, there is not the best potential in some schools for pupils to do music and the, um, the art subjects. Could you comment on that a bit yes. further? Yes, well, in fact, after this meeting, I'm heading to West Lothian um, to meet with city council leadership there to urge them to see if we can partner to keep string provision alive uh, in the area. Um, you have to start certain art forms very young at primary school. If you don't start strings in primary school, if you don't start ballet in primary school, then you will be too late to even begin to approach the level that you would need to study um, at the Royal Conservatoire. But further than that, uh, we want to make the case in partnership with all parties and with government that uh, the, the country will benefit from the creative learning that access to the performing arts provides. Physical education is statutory, but performing arts isn't. So we're, we're saying you must exercise the body, but what about the, the critical need to exercise creativity and the imagination that performing arts provides. So we want to work in partnership, but yes, we will be worried about the pipeline and our ability to attract students from the most disadvantaged areas, whether we measure it by SIMD or whether we measure it by rural deprivation, it will become harder to do if the provision doesn't stay accessible and if not free, but certainly affordable uh, for young people in the country. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joanne, do you want to come in? Thanks very much. I want to make maybe a brief point about advanced hires first of all, and then um, a more substantive point. In a situation where um, a young person from more deprived areas is less likely to be able to sit five or six hires in fifth year, access to adv advanced hires becomes really important. But you, what we're now in a situation is where not only is a young person from a poorer background less likely to be able to do a good group of hires in fifth year, they're also not going to access advanced hires. And even if they do, you've just said that universities are going to count hires more. This surely is unacceptable. Is there a long-term plan to make a decision about which qualification matters most? Is it the advanced hire? Is it the higher? And if, which of these should it be? And how do we then make sure that young people from more deprived backgrounds have access to those? Because I would also make the point that for a lot of young people, their first year at university is a repeat of what they've done in their advanced hires. And that, you know, in circumstances where for perhaps young people have uh, got less access, you know, to income, that again is not the best use of their time and resource. I wonder how do we resolve this dilemma? Could I possibly, for any of my colleagues, give the real expert practitioner view, just just on a statistical level, um, it's important to note that re there's really very few students um, coming to university with a good clutch of advanced tyres at the moment. Um, through the Learn Journey Review, I think it's, it's, it's kind of around the 5% um, rate. So, uh, and that reflects the, the, the low availability um, of advanced tyres. So I think uh, recognising the senior phase is, is one in which learners are often taking hires over multiple years. I think universities have engaged with that and increasingly recognise that the accumulation of uh, qualifications over uh, the multiple years of a senior phase um, is, is something that's valued for entry requirements. But my, my colleagues are more expert on this. Would anyone like to speak? In that case, can I maybe give you a, um, a direct example of, I think, the challenge we've got, and I'd be interested in your um, solution to this. So there's a young woman who has got a good clutch of hires, which would, she would be considered and has been given offers for universities down south. She doesn't live in a SIMD area, but her family income is 11,000 a year. She cannot get access to university in Scotland because the qualification is higher, because, in my view, we are rationing places at university because of the cap. So we're rationing by qualification in circumstances where young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to be able to reach that. Um, she can't go to university down south because she can't afford to live away from home. So what do we do? She, isn't in a, she doesn't get a contextualised offer. So in a circumstance where universities are giving multiple offers to some young people who qualify for a contextualised um, place, 
this young woman can't access a place at all and is going to have to go, if she does at all, she would have to go down south. What is this? How can that possibly be a rational way of dealing with the whole question of access to higher education for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds? It's an incredibly difficult circumstance. Um, and I think one of, one of the things it points to is the need to me measure deprivation intelligently. Um, that if we are simply um, being tasked with, with, with you know, meeting targets on the basis of SIMD, then we know that, um, that the target, not, not universities' action, because universities' action should be, should be for everyone who's, de who's got deprivation characters, but, but we know that targets don't make sense if, if they are excluding, um, as the authors of SIMD themselves say, about two-thirds of the people who are income deprived. We really need to be looking much more intelligently at, at the indicators of who needs that special act treatment. The issues round, and I've spoken about this before, about the density of dis disadvantage, even if you yourself within that community are not disadvantaged, and that has an impact in the school you go to and so on. However, what representations have been made simply to address a very simple question. A young woman who comes from a family with income is 11,000 a year, and she does not get a contextualised offer. Surely we could change that by the end of the summer. Can I comment in, in reference to the University of the West of Scotland? Uh, I don't know the, the example that you're referring to, but I can assure you that at my university, when students apply to the university, we are looking at their capability to complete the degree. And whether they come with advanced hires, whether they come with hires, or whether they don't come with any qualifications, it's the capacity that they can demonstrate that they can complete the award on the basis on which we would, would uh, offer them a place. Very happy to look at the application you're referring to and uh, consider whether they should be eligible for a UWS place. Uh, could I also say at the University of Aberdeen, we are not in a position where we can simply use SIMD uh, data, and we simply don't. I see Richard Lockhead's here. Um, if we look in Murray, there is one, one SIMD postcode which uh, would fit within the um, definition uh, of disadvantaged. And Richard, I think we might both agree that Murray is a very beautiful place, but it is not a bastion of privilege right across the place. So therefore, at the University of Aberdeen, we have to look at a broader level of disadvantage, and we do that um, by looking uh, at, at a wider range of where the school is, what the income level is, what um, the whether it's the first generation from a household to go to university, and we make contextualised admissions to anyone, regardless of their geography, who we believe has that opportunity. I really can't speak to, obviously, the case that you've just described, um, but my own view would be that, again, if this person were in the catchment area, so to speak, of the University of Aberdeen, because I recognise that this young person uh, wishes to, to live at home, uh, then again, as Professor Mahoney has said, we would be prepared to look at them. But you also raised one other point, which I just personally agree with. Uh, if we have a cap on the number of places, then there has to be restriction, and qualifications are the only way we have at the moment of uh, making a decision other than also, as we do very, very passionately at the University of Aberdeen, and I know other universities do, using contextualised admissions where appropriate. I think that's exceptionally helpful, but would it be reasonable to ask um, Alistair Sim that it should be, I mean, the good practice by the University of West of Scotland. We shouldn't be relying on good practice by individual universities to make up our numbers. So is it reasonable to say to universities across the board they should take the same approach, that income should be part of a contextualised um, application, or are you restricted by government policy in doing that? Um, I, I think we, as, as, as a university sector, are determined to make sure that we're using indicators that, that make sense, and that's why um, our admissions working group is now looking at how, how do we extend beyond SIMD and care experienced um, candidates to recognise across the sector um, indicators of disadvantage um, that should be taken into consideration for admissions. And so, for instance, we're looking, um, we're, we're getting data from the Scottish Government on uh, free school meals, education maintenance, that was entitlement, which may be more robust indicators. Income, I can see the rationale for. I think there are problems at the moment about actually getting access to income data before people apply to university. I think there's a bit of systems thinking needed before income itself can necessarily be used as an indicator. But um, we, we do need to look... Um, I think across the sector, um, at having an intelligent range of indicators of, of who is disadvantaged. 
I, mean, I think it's a related issue. This is the last question. It's a related issue for young people, say, for example, wanting to do medicine from a, a poorer background, and they may be offered a place. They come from Glasgow. They're offered a place in Aberdeen, but not in Glasgow, and it's impossible for them to take it up because the cost is so much. And I wonder whether the universities have thought about that too, in relation to um, thinking about you know, their, their contextualised offers in those kinds of courses. I can, I can speak to the University of Aberdeen, uh, and, and it is, I mean, I take your point, and it's very difficult. That's one of the reasons why uh, we have um, offered a year of free accommodation uh, to people from disadvantaged backgrounds, because we recognise that while fees may be free, it costs serious money to go to university, uh, and people are getting into debt in order to be there, first point, and it's, it's often credit card debt, which is bad debt in my view. But in addition, people are working very long hours in paid employment alongside their studies, and we believe that's not great because we are passionate about the co-curriculum and people engaging with everything about being at university and growing as an active citizen. Uh, and so there are real challenges, and, and frankly, it comes down there to money to enable people to live away from home. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ross, and then Richard and George. Thanks, Convener. A brief question still on uh, admissions. Um, we know that the, the admissions process, particularly for those who don't have a family background in higher education, can be quite daunting. Um, Alistair Sim mentioned in his opening remarks the um, improvements that we can get in, in outcomes in terms of admissions uh, from strong contextualised admission processes. That's welcome, but it does add an extra layer to the process. And I'm wondering what your institutions do to ensure that particularly for uh, those individuals coming from backgrounds where they would be able to take advantage of contextualised admission policy, how to make that as understandable as possible for both the applicant and those supporting them, whether it's school staff or, or their family? How do we make sure that this is a process, this extra layer of policy is something that's clearly understood? Say, I Could I just say, I think that's an incredibly... Uh, I'm sorry, you come through the convener. Uh, I'm totally you go, sorry. Professor Diamond and then Professor Sharkey. Convener, through you, could I just say that's a really important question. And I think it is incredibly important to recognise the amount of work that universities across Scotland uh, are doing uh, with schools. We, uh, at the University of Aberdeen, run an Access Aberdeen uh, initiative where we work with uh, a whole set of schools which have progression rates of lower than 30% right across um, the, the north and northeast uh, of Scotland. And we give people individual support, support about going to university, support about with, with applications. And I can say, for example, in the access to medicine um, part of that, um, current medical students will go and do practice interviews with intending medical students so that we will do everything we can to give people a fair opportunity and to enable them to negotiate, which if it's the first time you've ever done it, uh, a, a, a challenging bureaucracy. Um, we are an ensemble school, so everything we do, it might be an acting group, a dance group, a music, an orchestra, we, you have to have people that can work together. Uh, so we want to engage early, uh, we want to raise aspiration early, and the goal is to have not only access, but access that leads to progression. Uh, and so within the conservatoire, we have a program that we're grateful the Scottish Funding Council supports called Transitions, where we try to identify from primary school age uh, young people in deprived areas that would benefit from specific music, dance, drama, or production training. Uh, and we work with them, we mentor them, we give them practice auditions with the goal being that by the time they reach the age of 17 for dance or 18 for all the other things, they would be at the right level. Through Focus West, we work with a number of uh, low uh, schools from deprived areas, uh, and we have a strong partnership there, again, raising aspiration. But it is all about discrete engagement at, a, at an early level, and we're continuing to work to get better at it. And going back to uh, Johan Lamont's question, um, 
one worry I have is with the, with the extreme focus on SIMD20, it, uh, similar to uh, Surian Diamond here, uh, it, that doesn't help us with our, um, our traditional music course, which is largely from rural deprived areas. We have a number of people from SIMD40 in our transitions program that frankly we will have to winnow out to keep focusing more on the 20 so that we can meet those advanced targets. So there are, there are consequences by the way you measure it. But overall, early access and progression is what we're after. And if I could... Yeah. Sorry, there was a couple of... Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I'll let Ross come back in and then you can follow up. It was that. just, it's a brief supplementary yeah, to yeah. Uh, Ian. So um, just, you mentioned work, working with, with schools in your area. Did that approach, I, I realise that there'll be historical elements to this that go back a, a long way. Has that approach largely happened through the education authorities or do you as an institution engage on a school-by-school -school basis? In partnership with the education authorities, but within the schools on a school-by-school -school basis. And of course, there are, you know, what, what I am passionate about is that we don't identify, the, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly for effect, but one school, which is in a really disadvantaged area, and every university in the area is in supporting that school, and we're not everywhere else. So we do try to make sure that where we're working, for example, our good friends at Robert Gordon's are not working so hard and then, and we make sure that people have the opportunity to choose university not simply to come to Aberdeen thank you okay thank you uh, Ruth you says you got a very uh, brief supplementary just, on this just, uh, thank you convener just a very brief supplementary to what professor Sharkey said there um, you mentioned going out and raising aspiration a couple of times and I wonder if you would just agree that it's important to acknowledge that folk from deprived um, or less fortunate backgrounds. It's not lack of aspiration that's preventing them going to university often, that it's the structural barriers in their way, the complexity of application processes, money, things like that. I just wondered if you might like to clarify. That. Yes, it, I, I agree that, but what we want to show is that someone from any background, we also are interested in ethnic diversity increase, uh, could imagine themselves on that stage. So we were trying to reach them earlier to say this could be really exciting and for you. Okay, right, thank you very much, Richard, and then George. Thank you, and Professor Ian, uh, Sir Ian Diamond kind of gazumped my question, which was about the, the use of the 20% most deprived areas in measuring success of wedding access. Um, so I very much welcome the, the comments on that. Can I just ask, to what extent are you able to go into rural areas and encourage people to apply to go to university? Because if I were to live in a very remote area, I would think of the transport difficulties, I'd think about the expense of having to move to the city to pay for the accommodation, and I'd think what an enormous expense and what a lot of hassle uh, and obstacles are in my way. And I just wondered how you proactively go out there into those areas that don't count as part of the 20%, but are still people living in deprived areas, uh, to encourage them to apply in the first place. Thank you very much. Um, and I just think it's, that is the, one of the most important questions, because if we look at Shetland, Orkney, Highland, Murray, Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City, that's 46% of the geography of Scotland, but only 17% uh, of the postcodes and only 4% of the, those postcodes are from disadvantaged areas. So we need to be much broader. Uh, and, our, and the point I would make about encouraging is one that I would agree with Professor Sharkey. It needs to be early. It can't be when people are just doing S4, we say, hey, have you thought of university? You know, we're in schools for a long time, getting those aspirations up and making it seem that this is something that you can do. And I take the point about bureaucracy. I take the point about money. It's incredibly important. But we also, so we're working in schools. We also run an access summer school because it's important to get people onto campus and, and know what it's like to be in, in a university environment. And that access summer school for disadvantaged pupils, we say, look, if, if, if you do well on that, we'll give you a place for sure. Um, but, but we just have to recognise that in places like Tariff and Afford, um, it is about working with people and, and offering them the opportunity that you can come. And I'm always um, proud that every year um, we, we get one or two people coming from places like Kinloch Shield, you know, which you know, there's only 65 people in, in, in that secondary school. But the fact that you know, they've got enough aspiration to come to the University of Aberdeen, we're incredibly proud to welcome them. But can I also say that it is incredibly important when people have made that enormous journey 
that we do everything we can as a university to welcome them and give them a sense of belonging early on. Widening access is great, but it's useless if it's accompanied by dropout. Widening access has to be, in my opinion, about widening achievement. Uh, and I'll come back and I'll just say it one more time, if I may. I do think that money is incredibly important here, and money to be able to get the full benefits from higher uh, education. And that's why, in a review uh, that I did uh, before the Government of Wales, the recommendation we had was a means-tested um, grant to people which, for those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, was 30 weeks at 35 hours at the national uh, living wage. And that has been implemented by the Welsh Government. And you will see an increase in the um, access for people from disadvantaged backgrounds through that. Professor Mahoney, you want to come in? Specifically on the last question, but working backwards on previous comments made as well, um, the University of Western Scotland, as you probably know, has a footprint in Dumfries. Um, it's a generally rural setting, <laughs> apologies Oliver, um, and we recruit widely from that area by doing all sorts of outreach activities, but you make the point which I'd like to reiterate. We recruit students from Stran Ra who, who cannot, by public transport, arrive at the campus before nine o'clock because of the restrictions on the availability of public transport. So we've accommodated our curriculum to be able to allow those people to attend. In, in case of the other campuses that we have, uh, we do a lot of outreach work, and in the same way as Professor Dime has just been referring, uh, things such as summer schools, we, we run a, a NASA um, partnership program every year in Renfrewshire, um, Clyde Bank and, and East Renfrewshire, bringing in over 250 students onto the university campus to participate in an astronaut program with experiments which eventually go into space. The reason we do that is because we know that breaking down barriers about being on a university campus is something that helps widen access. Additionally, we're involved and a partner of the Children's University concept. Uh, in fact, I think we are now the largest university and uh, the largest um, partner uh, provider of Children's University activity in Scotland. And we developed our own We University last year, which is a concept for pre-school uh, children to be involved in university access. All, att all attempting to break down the barriers of access and, and see university as a natural progression for those who desire to get a qualification at that level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Susan Stewart and then Professor Shark. We're unique in that we don't require any um, educational, formal educational qualifications before you come to the Open University, which means that pre-entry advice and guidance is utterly critical in order to ensure that students are choosing the correct curriculum to maximise their chances of success. On SIMD20, I would echo what my colleague said. Whilst our national figure is 17% of students from SIMD20 areas, a quarter of our students are from rural and remote Scotland, often because they don't go full-time to traditional campus universities because of some of the challenges that have been uh, mentioned. However, 40% of our students in Glasgow come from SIMD20, so it's a very variable picture. In relation to maintenance uh, uh, grants, I, I would say that whilst the Student, the review of student finance w was interesting. It was disappointing to us that they chose not to deal with part-time students. That's something that the, the Welsh Government in relation to the Diamond Review ha have dealt with. They've given parity to part-time provision as well as full-time. Okay. Professor Scher. I just wanted to say in terms of reaching uh, the Outer Hebrides and other places, we've been trying to pioneer some digital work. Um, and I think the committee saw a couple of students, uh, one from South Uist, another from Isla, who three weeks out of the month, this is pre-HE, um, we engage with using a program called eStaccato, which uses Google Hangout, so it's not too high end, it's possible to get to. And then once a month, they make the longer journey. And uh, that, that combination we, we found to be very effective in reaching more people. Can I just say, Google Hangout might not sound high-end to you, but it's <laughs> a complete mystery to me. Uh, George. Oh, sorry, Richard, you come back in. Yeah, my apologies. Well, just, perhaps just very brief answers. Uh, it's kind of been touched upon in terms of the, the maintenance grants, but the, if you achieve your targets, and clearly people from deprived backgrounds will still have their challenges in life, uh, so that means that more support may have to be made available in the future once you get your targets. How has that been calculated? Is that, is, am I correct in thinking that's an issue? Is that being built into your response? Uh, can I just ask a question to you? Do you? By which do you mean that the support when they get to university? Yes. It's incredibly important and it's something we talk about a lot. Um, the first, I think, real evidence on this came from the University of Glasgow 
who showed that if you give extra support during first semester to people from disadvantaged backgrounds, then after that, they achieved at the same level as everybody. And that extra support, which is something I first proposed in some work I did uh, at the University of St. Andrews in 1978, um, is incredibly important. Um, how do you pay for it? You pay for it because you're committed to making it happen, um, and you don't, there is no extra funding for it. But it is, in my opinion, incredibly important that we give that extra support. It's about giving people a sense of belonging, giving people a sense of progression, uh, and making them feel that they should be at the institution. And that first semester is incredibly uh, important, and it's something we work very hard on at the University of Aberdeen. But that's not to say it's not also worked on very hard at many other universities across Scotland. We'll soon find out. Uh, does somebody else want one? No. I just wanted to say, I mean, the funding for this is really wrapped up into the overall teaching grant for, for, for Scottish universities. So, I mean, this is, um, you know, the, the case that we make to Scottish government for, for um, sustainable funding of, of teaching at universities is you're not just paying for the teaching, you're paying for all the wraparound support, you're paying for the extra work to make sure that people um, are supported to to achieve their full potential at university, you're paying for the mental health support, you're paying for extra pastoral care. Um, so, um, as, as we become... Um, more and more ambitious for including um, a wider range of people from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, it really becomes more and more important that, that uh, our teaching is funded at a level that enables us to offer the best support we can to people who are often coming from quite difficult backgrounds. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rich, George and then Gillian, sorry. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I, I would just like to... I've got two questions, but I would just like to sneak another one in just in the back of what Richard did. Uh, well, two plus a sneaky one. Uh, but basically, I just wanted to ask Craig Mahoney in particular, you know, you've done a lot of this work in actually supporting students because you knew there was a drop-off rate. Could you maybe just explain to us, so we've got it on the record, uh, the successes and the challenges you've faced while you've been doing that? Thanks, George. Um, and, and as a supporter of the university locally, I'm very appreciative of your continued uh, liaison with us. UWS, as you probably know from your own data, uh, widens access very well. Um, almost 30% of our student body is comprised of students who come from MD20 backgrounds, and over 50% of our students come from MD40 backgrounds. Um, something the university is very proud of, and we continue to expand those numbers in an effort to be sure that we can transform lives in the way that we think we, we do very effectively. Uh, in recent years, our progression rates have been challenging. We've had students who have not completed the award they came for. Um, and whilst on the face of it that looks as though that's a failure, um, we're quite clear that those students who do come to university, even if they engage with and experience only a modest amount of time there and may leave without a formal qualification, are still also transforming their lives. And quite often what we find is that some of our early exit students are leaving because they find employment. So they came to university to get a qualification, but if employment comes along, quite often their sense of responsibility is that the employment's more important than getting the qualification, so they jump. Uh, and so you know, our data, particularly on, on honours graduates, um, is that we only have about 50% of our students who go on to do a final year and get an honours degree. And that's mainly because they can get employment at the end of third year with a past degree and go into that employment. Um, to, to improve our retention, which is, is now, um, uh, it's easy for me to refer to dropout, our dropout rates uh, reduced itself by, by nearly 17% over the last few years. In other words, we're keeping students in the system much more uh, effectively than previously. And that's come about by improving our own systems, um, being more careful in the students that we encourage to come to university and making the right choices for them and us in, in allowing them onto courses, ensuring that our induction programs are finessed in a way which enables them to create partnerships and friendships early on, uh, explains to them the systems and structures of the university on their arrival so that they're able to navigate the, the many complex pathways which exist in a, in a university for anybody, regardless of their age, um, improving our, our in-house systems. So we, we've created what I often liken to uh, floor walkers that you'll find in John Lewis, uh, where when you enter John Lewis, somebody will come and say to you, can I help you, what would you like to do? And we have staff now whose responsibility it is, following a pilot scheme, to identify students who appear to be struggling in whatever form that may be. It could be lost uh, in terms of finding direction, it may be finance, it may be personal circumstances, and trying to pick those things up more rapidly along the way. We've improved our personal tutor system. And there's a variety of other systems and techniques we've put in place at a cost, and the point that, uh, that uh, Alastair was making is that the wraparound fee that we get uh, covers many things, not just teaching. 
I'd, I'd like to also add that within that, and some years back, the university, uh, in, in response to a government request, widened the number of students that it takes. So we have uh, almost 1,000 students now <laughs> on our portfolio, a portfolio of 18,800 students, that's a head count, we have nearly 1,000 students who are what are called fees only. I'm sure that's a familiar term to you, but if it's not, we have eight, uh, 994 students who uh, the government pays us 1,820 pounds, uh, compared to an average fee for the remaining students, uh, in Scottish and EU, of around 6,500 pounds. Um, now that creates uh, a shortfall, if you like, of nearly 4.6 million pounds. Um, in our income to deliver the support to the widening access and other students in the university. I merely make that as a point. I'm not complaining, uh, but, but I merely make that as a point to, to help you understand why UWS is doing what it's doing in the way in which it does it. Just on the, uh, the back of what Craig's already said there, it kind of fits into my, what was going to be my main question, was the fact that, you know, when we are looking at widening access, we're looking at bringing people into university that don't have a family history of going to university. And I know UWS was specific way of doing it. I know OU is a very per uh, peculiar, uh, particular, <laughs> particular way of doing it. Uh, uh, but how do we get to that stage where we get beyond that barrier, you know, that engagement, where we get beyond that barrier of universities, no for me? You know, when mum and dad haven't been, the support's not there. How do we get it down to that very basic way of being able to actually access that young person and get them to go to uh, the university? They may have the talent, they may have the ability, but how do we make sure we get there? Go first. I'll, I'll just kick off, if I may, and then pass on to, to, to other colleagues. It's exactly the right question, if I may say so, but there is no one answer. Mm -hmm. the, if, if there was a magic bullet, we'd all have fired it. The bottom line is there's a mass of things that we have to do. I've talked already about engagement with schools from an early age, about bringing young people and their parents on to campus. Craig has already talked uh, about children's university. We do that simply for that reason, to bring their parents and them onto campus at an early age and say, you could be here Two, this is an opportunity for you. And navigating the bureaucracy has to be incredibly important. So having a strategy which says we will help you with your applications is also important. But critically, and it comes back to the point that Liz Smith made right at the beginning, the schools have to be engaged with this. Careers advice in schools has to be saying you could go to university in exactly the same way as I was shocked 45, 50 years ago, whenever it was, when somebody uh, at my school said that I could go to university. Now, that is something we need to make the norm. So my answer is there's no magic bullet here. We've got to be doing everything that we've been talking about so far. Craig. Yeah. To get through, can I ask that the answers are, are much more succinct? Thank you. I think there are many examples, and following on from Professor Diamond's commentary about uh, how we're all trying to do this, uh, similarly to me, uh, similarly to him rather, I, I went to university merely because my brother went, uh, and, and, and we were very competitive. So uh, there are lots of stories about first in family, and we still have a huge number of graduates from uh, UWS who are first in family. Um, I, I think the question we, which we need to ask as well is, what is the purpose of universities? And, and many of us will have differing opinions about that. I think it is changing, but many people come to university now because they're seeking a qualification to transform their lives to enter a workforce in which they want to work. Uh, but there are many routes into work, and I think we just need to remain sensitive to that fact that universities are not the only pathways to work. There are also direct entry, there are FE colleges, uh, and there are also universities. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. It, it, Joanne has got a very brief. Very brief. It, I just wanted to pick up on the point made by Professor Mahoney, because I think I've maybe missed the point you were making around financing. You're saying the Scottish Government asked you to expand the numbers of students coming by 1,000, but they fund them at £1,500 a head. And then you mentioned a figure, I think, of 6,000. And I wonder if you just clarify what that, that means. Uh, OK. <laughs> others, others can uh, correct me where I get this wrong, but uh, the average fee that, that the Scottish Government pays for, for students is £6,500. 
um, we have a further... So, so most of our students are bringing with them a stipend from the Scottish Government of £6,500. However, there's nearly 1,000 students that we have for which the Scottish Government only pays us £1,820, not 1500 1820 um, And uh, so it, it creates a difference between... And these students aren't identified. It creates a difference between the fee that we're getting for most students compared to a group of students which are being funded at a lower rate. Now, we did that... We did that because the government was seeking to widen access. And as a university that is committed to widening access, we've taken those students or those numbers on, and we continue to do so. And there'll be all of us sitting here will have students who are fees only. The number will vary between institutions, and universities will choose to decide if that's something that they can sustain. We, we can try and get some more information on that. Because uh, your model is completely different from everyone else's, yeah. you know, a campus-based model. So, yeah. uh, so uh, how, how you've been breaking down these barriers for decades, mm. you know, so can you give us... Yeah, we're, we're, we're 50 years old uh, next year, uh, so we've, we've been reaching hard-to-reach students uh, for five decades and, and have some experience in it. And there's a multiplicity of approaches and for traditional universities, starting young and making sure that we're dealing with young people in the early years. Uh, scenario is very important. I think probably one of the things we'd all agree on is that we need to get better at learning from the evidence that we have on what works in this area and then universalising what works. And on that point, uh, a unique learner number would certainly help us all track outcomes. In my institution, I'm keen to know uh, young people who do the YAS programme in six years does it change their aspirations in terms of university, what university they want to go to, what course they want to go to, and also critically, particularly those students who don't come from schools with the tradition of sending many people to university, does it help improve first-year retention? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it does, but getting the data from the universities that they go to is very, very difficult, because these YAS students don't come to OU, they tend to go to one of the 18 traditional universities in Scotland. OK, thank you. Uh, Gillian. Thank you much, Convener. <clears throat> I'd like to move on to talk about articulation, and I have got the recommendations here from the Commission for Fair Access. Um, and the ones I'm particularly interested in, and those who know me on the panel will know that I was a college lecturer for many years, so articulation is a subject very close to my heart. I've seen many of the graduates from the course that I taught go on to university and do extremely well, and then go on to have very fulfilling careers as a result. And some of the things that you're mentioning around um, dropout of people coming from school to university, um, I, I suppose I have some questions around, particularly the universities who have had an articulation programme, whether students who perhaps have come from school, never thought themselves as being university applicants, have come and done an HND, who have had that bridging experience of college, whether there's been any study done on whether they managed to come into a university setting and stay because they've had that bridging from college, first of all. But I'd also like to draw, um, ask, particularly the, the uh, Professor Ian Diamond and uh, Craig Mahoney, who I know have got, got uh, substantial articulation programmes, what their response is to the recommendations 15 and 16 from the Commissioner of Fair Access around um, taking on more HND students into second year, but I would also say third year is not mentioned as, as well, in, but third year is an option as well. And also having stronger links with local colleges um, to facilitate this. Let me just make a, a general observation for um, my colleagues who've got much more practitioner experience say something. I mean, I think this is an area that, that you know, we've made a lot of progress on, as it's referred to in our submission, and that we're committed to making um, more progress on, and we've got a joint project now with College of Scotland. Our National Articulation Forum involves multiple stakeholders, including um, NUS um, as, as well, um, to look at how we can drive articulation further. And particularly, I think we're narrowing down now on a range of subjects um, where um, students aren't articulating with, with as much credit as you might expect. Um, I think there are some subjects, you know, business administration, mass communication, engineering, etc., where actually students are generally articulating with credit from university. There's others, um, in, um, biological studies, social studies, law, for instance, where they're not typically articulating with, with full credit. And we really want to do a drill down to find out what's the curricular reason, what, what, what's happening between the HN 
um, and the university curriculum that, that's making that more difficult and how do we fix that? So I think we're now, you know, from a, a position of general commitment to articulation, we're now trying to get it into the nuts and bolts about how do you make some of the crunchy bits that aren't quite working yet um, work better than they might. But um, I'm sure practitioners will want to say something. Professor Mahoney. Um, thank you for the question and very happy to, uh, to give you the perspective from UWS. UWS articulates a number of students as you correctly identified. In fact, it's um, uh, data su suggests it's 2,000 students in the current year that we're in. We work uh, interactively with, with eight FE providers, and of course you, you'll know our footprint, Paisley, Hamilton, Eyre and Dumfries. So we work with local FE providers in those regions to allow students to articulate onto our programs. Um, I, I think you, you raise a question which needs a much wider discussion, and that is how, how is uh, what is essentially a recognition of prior learning, and there is a national framework for that here in Scotland, how is a recognition of a prior learning mapped against the curriculum the university is offering? Because that's the judgment made as to where somebody is allowed to enter. Uh, UWS, I'm fairly proud to say, in most cases would allow somebody with an HNC to enter level eight, second year, and somebody with an HND to enter level nine, third year. So that's typically what we do. I know that not, other, not all other universities do that. And again, that's about the mapping. If the curriculum from the previous award shows a skill gap and a knowledge gap with what's expected for a student who had been progressing through the university and into that level, then clearly there's a deficit that needs to be made up. And that can be done through summer programs or, or various other entry, uh, entry provisions. Um, but, but essentially, UWS is doing quite a lot of this. We're very proud of our relationships with the, with the FE sector. Um, and, uh, and, and we've been pretty successful at it. I think you asked another question as well within that, which is what is the learner journey like when they come to university? Undoubtedly, the intimacy of the contact at the FE College is much more intense than it will be in university. And sometimes students can struggle when they join a higher education institution to complete that element of a degree program. And we take a great deal of care. We have some permanent college liaison officers who work with the students articulating into the university to give them skills and knowledge and experience and exposure to the university before they come in, hopefully enabling them to have greater success. And I can't give you data here at the moment on the success rate, but my understanding is students who articulate to us do very well. Professor Damon. We have 111 uh, pathways now uh, with um, FE College. I should declare an interest. I chair Edinburgh College of Further Education, so you could invite me back uh, to speak for FE a little later. But let's just uh, see how you do it today. <laughs> thank you. Um, but I have nothing really to add to what Professor Mahoney has said for the very simple reason that we do much of the same. Just as an example, um, students coming from Aberdeen, um, North East Scotland College, um, to us to do engineering and articulating into third year, we put a lot of effort to make sure the mathematics is at the right level because, you know, so there's a kind of intellectual level, but there is also, uh, as Craig has rightly said, a social level, and we put a lot of effort into that. I'm also very impressed by the link between Forth Valley College and Stirling University, where on many courses, students at Forth Valley College in that first two years of the HN spend a day a week uh, studying in Stirling. That seems to me to be incredibly important because it means they get to know the campus, get to know their way around the, the types of studying from an early base. And also they're expecting to go if they want. So it's part of a pathway. So I do think we've got a lot to do. Um, I personally believe passionately uh, in articulation and articulating with full credit. Um, but as I say, at the University of Aberdeen, we are on an upward trend, very close links with a number uh, of um, FE uh, providers and intending to increase that. Okay, it's a join. Susan. Sorry, Susan. Susan. Briefly, uh, we've got articulation agreements with all 15 uh, colleges in Scotland outside of UHI. We've got an agreement, we um, leave that to them. So almost 20% of our students are coming in with HN qualifications and they do much better than the general cohort. So if they've got an HN qualification, they tend to uh, graduate with a better class of degree. We're also interested in talking to colleges and other universities about three-way partnerships whereby they can start off HN qualification in college, then do a couple of modules with us and then take that credit perhaps to some of the universities that are more competitive in terms of entry requirements. So very much a model we're keen on expanding. There was one other aspect. Um, I've had conversations with, with, with other uh, university principals around maybe having a greater partnership approach between universities and colleges and actually sharing resources. Um, and that could be a way to, 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 you know, bring college students and university students together in a way that actually, is that something that any of you have considered? 
Absolutely. It's a conversation that we have had, uh, and I think it's the future, frankly. You know, when I look at the facilities at Edinburgh College of Further Education, they're much better in some areas than the facilities at the University of Aberdeen, um, and vice versa. And therefore, it seems to me that that kind of partnership has to be a good thing for the people we're most interested in, the learners. Support what, what um, Ian has just said, but to give you some examples from our point of view, in Dumfries on the Crichton campus, um, we share in partnership with the local FE provider there a number of things. That the library, for example, which is hosted in their building, is run by my staff. And so we provide a library facility for all five providers, HE and FE, who are located on that Crichton campus site. An example of good practice, in my opinion, and one which works very successfully in allowing students to integrate between FE and HE on a regular basis. We're just about to open a partnership uh, with West College Scotland around construction engineering, which will have a facility located on their campus that is, that is uh, delivered and supported by our staff. Geography makes a challenge sometimes, but uh, wherever possible, we are very keen to work in partnership with the FE's, FE providers, sharing resources, which can be staff or, or facilities wherever possible. And just a, a final sorry. We don't have a campus, obviously, yeah. but what we do have in five colleges are OU learning spaces, and they were designed to offer a physical space for OU students to go in and study, but I've also had the, the benefit of college students seeing their peers doing an OU degree and thinking, well, that's maybe perhaps something that I can think about after my HN qualification, so there's been that benefit too. Can I, can I ask you, uh, Susan, what, what percentage or around about of, of school leavers, of young people, and I think there's a perception sometimes about the Open University yeah. being for ad, ad, adult learners yeah. or returner learners. Yeah. I mean, is it, is it still... Our average age is 26, right. which is, I think, younger than, than people would expect. Yeah. And that is, to some extent in Scotland, skewed slightly by our YAS students. Uh, <coughs> but for the whole of the UK, the average age is 27, so it's not skewed that right. much. I just question. have one final Fifth. question, convener, Fifth. and that's uh, around recommendations 15 and 16. And I guess maybe the answer, the, the, the question is directly for, for Alistair Sim. Do you feel that you are on target for reaching and uh, achieving the recommendations that have been asked of universities in terms of articulation as set out by the Commissioner for Fair Access? Um, Yes, as long as they're, they're, they're understood um, intelligently. I mean, I think um, we are now at the nearest percentage point at 58% of people who are articulating within, within the same subject area um, articulating with full credit. Um, and so, you know, I think we're, we, we are very much on, on a growth path um, towards more and more people who do articulate within the same subject area um, um, reaching towards the, 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 the SFC target. I would also say, though, that we do need to maintain space for people to completely change subject between college and university. Um, and if you change subject, um, if you're changing that, that pathway quite fundamentally, then you're not, you're not going to, to, to bring your full credit from college with you. You're going to, you know, you, it's simply not possible. Um, and we need to facilitate people's ability to have learner journeys that aren't as neatly linear um, as choosing a particular subject when you enter a college and pursuing that um, all the way through to, um, to a degree. Um, I think we also need to just protect the ability of people to actually say, I'm not really ready for um, the third year of an honours degree. I think my educational journey um, will be better supported if actually I step back um, and come into university at an earlier stage. That can and often is um, the personal <coughs> choice of a learner to do what they think is, is, is right for achieving the best possible outcome for them. So I think we're on a path, but I think we've got to recognise that learners themselves I've got a variety of, of choices and needs that we need to respect. Okay, thank you. Can I just come back on that last bit then? That, uh, you're saying that you are you're confident that you'll achieve the targets, but you might not achieve the targets because of actions that students take. Uh, well, I think it depends how you understand the target. If, if you, I mean, SFCs, I mean, I, I mean, the target referred to here is of 75% articulation with full credit. Um, I think that makes sense if you're talking about articulation within the same subject area. Um, and I think, and this is acknowledged in the Scottish Government's own learner journey review report from, from last week, I think um, you have to take the learners um, who are changing subject out of that target because it's simply not possible to take someone who's, who's completely changing their subject area and say, can you come into um, you know, first year honours, uh, third, third, third year at at the university, it's not doing them a favour um, to take them into something that they've, 
they've not they've not prepared to succeed in. Yeah, but I thought that would already have been taken into account when, uh, in terms of the targets anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tavish and then Liz. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, can I move on to funded places? The, the cap on funded places means, I suppose, that some applicants are being squeezed out. Is there any evidence of that, or do we, un do we understand what that yet means? If I were to give a, a, a personal impression, I would say it's probably an in incipient rather than current major problem. Um, I mean, I think when, when you look at um, the data in our submission, um, on increases in entrance to, to university, and what you're what you're broadly seeing at the moment um, is growth in um, people coming in from the most deprived quintile um, and relative stability um, in people coming in from the other quintiles. So you know, that that that's not an unreasonable picture at the moment. I think um, as you look towards the future and, and towards achieving the the, the, the targets that, that we all aspire to for um, 2030. Um, uh, you, you, as, as, you, as you increase your, your recruitment from the most deprived um, parts of um, the community, you also want to protect your ability um, to, to recruit from all the other um, parts of the community, all the other quintiles, um, you know, many of whom are also ex dis but displaying characteristics policy, disadvantage. You can't square that circle. Yeah. So um, I think over the period to, to 2030, we, we were certainly saying, look, um, to achieve that, um, it's reasonable to look for um, growth in the number of funded places so that we can be fair to everybody. That's, that's what we want to be. And that, I think uh, we have the opportunity to do that. Government. Sorry? That means more money. Um, so that, that means, um, well, it means more funded places, which, as, as we um, have said, you know, we, we have the opportunity as uh, we look beyond um, Brexit that okay. some of the money, yeah. you know, so we will have different no profile of EU if, students. If there's no more money, there's no more funded places, unless you find some other way to fund it, then there will be a squeeze. Um, uh, yes, but I think yeah. um, while we wish to maintain, you know, our openness to EU students in the future and while, while they're important um, to, to many of our subject areas and, and to our skills pipeline, I think there will be a rebalancing between Scottish domiciled and, and EU students and I think that does release an opportunity to to widen access while being fair to everybody else. Sure. So let me just understand that. A rebalancing means what? Who's, who, which, which group is less and which group is more? Um, a rebalancing means, I mean, I, I would expect there to be fewer EU yeah. domiciled yeah. undergraduates in the system after the Brexit transition period, while still maintaining our openness to at least some sustainable number of them. Well, we'd probably better not debate Brexit, because we did that <laughs> yesterday at some length. Um, Lucy Blackburn Hunter, sorry, Lucy Hunter Blackburn's research for the period 10 to 16 for 18 year olds applications and acceptances suggests that the group that is most at risk of displacement are young people in the middle middle quantile. Do you accept that? Is that uh, um, I think research the, suggests that? I think the um, the, 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 the the commissioner um, himself made made similar remarks he that did. Um, um, as 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 you look at you know which categories of the population. Um, are finding that their applications to the university are more likely to be accepted. Um, you, you're finding that the, the most privileged quintile continues to do well. Um, the least privileged um, are, are increasingly um, finding it, it possible to get into university and, and, and their application success is now you know, right up there with, with the norm. Um, there is some evidence of a little bit of a, a relative squeeze on, on the middle, but I think, as I said at the beginning of this... I have plenty you know, of anecdotal this, evidence of it, yeah. from mums and dads going yeah. through around supermarkets telling me it's happening, and head teachers telling me it's happening as well. Yeah. So I just, just, just thought the university sector, given you're dealing with the offering uh, at the moment, you must have... You must have masses of data about how many young people are applying and therefore are getting in or not getting in. You must have a pretty decent feel for what's now happening. Could I... Could I respond? Answer yes for our university. We do. Um, and while I agree uh, fully with Alastair perhaps about the, if you like, overall, within the University of Aberdeen, there are many subjects that we would like to take more students onto, where students are well qualified, well, well qualified Scottish students who would be able to come, but we do not have the space for them. Mm. I, what I cannot tell you is when we sadly, and it is very difficult for us, but when we sadly have to say we don't have the space for you, I can't tell you where they go, whether they go to other universities in Scotland to study the subject they really wish to, whether they go to other universities in Scotland for a subject that is their second or third choice, or whether they are pushed either into England or not to university. Yeah, but it, yeah. 
and that's a pretty big gap in our understanding of what's happening. In yeah. So what, how would you improve that understanding, the, the point that Susan made about the learner, the learner journey, the, sorry, the learner number, giving everyone an ID number? Does that help? Well, I think it's, it's, it's one of the things we want people to do is, is actually, you know, for every learner, trace what's, what happens to them through a system, you know, right from school through, through college or university okay. or college and university um, through to employment, so, so, so that one could actually do this sort of fairly sophisticated analysis um, about what are the patterns that, that tend yeah. to lead people to, to success right through the education system and into employment. No, thank you for that. I mean, but I just say very quickly, I am absolutely passionate. Scotland is one of the very, very best places in the world mm. for research on linked administrative data. The University of Edinburgh and colleagues are just brilliant. It is absolutely, it seems to me, given that skill exists, not impossible to use the kind of uh, approach that Susan has suggested mm. to link with other data to come back to where we started today uh, around income properly to understand all the questions that you are absolutely rightly asking. Thank you. So it would be fair to, what, to ask the Commissioner to bring us some evidence once he's had that opportunity to discuss with your sector what is actually happening, so we understand what, are the, what in effect are the unintended consequences of this policy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Liz? Uh, thank you. Can I just pursue the theme that Tavish Scott has been on? Um, Professor Diamond, you were... Uh, saying very publicly last year that one of the groups for whom you had frustration and not being able to accept more was for medical undergraduates, um, particularly at a time with GP um, problems of recruitment, uh, and you would like, in, a, in an ideal world, to be able to take on more very well qualified domiciled Scots who had an interest in medical um, career. Could, could I ask you, do you think that the government should sh pursue a policy as it has done um, in recent times of increasing the cap for these specific subject areas where there is um, a, a dearth of students, sorry, a dearth of the places that you would like to uh, offer, or do you think that we would require to have a fundamental review of the structure of the funding of higher education? <laughs> Thank you very much for that very, very interesting uh, question. Let me respond. I mean, uh, one of the most difficult things that I ever do is when uh, MSPs, and some of you may have written to me uh, in the past, with you know, cases of, of your constituents who have unbelievably good highest qualifications, really would like to be uh, a doctor, uh, and they are one or two percentage points below a line, even after, for example, the contextual admissions we give. The University of Aberdeen has a fantastic record in training doctors and training doctors who subsequently work in Scotland, uh, and we would love to be able to increase our numbers. Medical students are a particular case, um, and we uh, have also, I think, uh, you will know, but I'll tell you, uh, a, a really wonderful program just starting, which the Scottish Government have supported very well for widening access, where the students come and do a year at North East Scotland College. They are all disadvant from disadvantaged backgrounds. They are all, I have to tell you, doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. They've been supported fully, and they will all, I'm sure, almost all of them, probably not, hopefully all of them, will become doctors in a few years' time, and isn't that it's just a fantastic programme. We'd love to expand it. So, question, you know, um, do we need to um, expand the number of medical students? My own view is that that would be a very good thing, uh, and we at the University of Aberdeen would be delighted to take some more students. Do you then move that to a question, do we need a fundamental review uh, of higher education funding? Now, look, I've just done one. Uh, for the Welsh Government, and I think an enormous amount of really interesting information came out which has really impacted on policy in Wales that is exciting, uh, not only for full-time students, but for, but for part-time students as well. Um, it is for you, uh, as elected uh, representative in this committee, to decide whether you feel uh, such a review would be useful for Scotland. Were you so to do, I would be delighted to help in any way I could. Thank you, Professor uh, Diamond. Can I just ask you very specifically on that very helpful answer? Would you get re remove the cap? Would you remove the cap? Look, I, I, I personally 
have said for many, many years that I believe fundamentally in the Robbins principle from the 1960s that everyone who has the ability to go to university and wishes so to do should be able to do so. Thank you. Could I just say that the corollary of removing the cap would be that you need to fund each place um, that, that for, for university expansion. I mean, if, if, if you simply remove the cap, you actually compound the problem that, that Craig has um, expressed of, of expecting more students to be taught for the same amount of money. So um, I think, you know, being fully supportive of Robin's principle, um, if there were a political choice to remove the cap, it would also be a political choice that the funding for each student in an expanding system should be sufficient to enable us not just to teach them, but to support them with everything we need to to, to enable them to graduate successfully, including the pastoral support. And can I also really make the clear point of the role of FE uh. in teaching HE? Yeah, I'm glad that you both, Professor Mahoney and yourself, have brought up the role of FE. Uh, Ruth? Good morning, panel. Um, before I move on to my main question, I just wanted to say that we've obviously heard great evidence of, of good work that's going on this morning, but there's clearly a real disparity between universities in Scotland and, and how successful they are being, would you accept that it's time for some other institutions to do a little bit more, to work a little bit harder in terms of widening access? And if so, what would you have them do and when would you have them do it by? Um, well, I, 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 I think others may wish to com comment on what their institutions are doing, um, but if I could just give the, 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 the general answer to that, I think um, you know, genuinely, every institution is, is working extremely hard at this. Um, I mean, the, the most selective institutions obviously are facing the, 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 the biggest challenge in a sense that, that um, relatively few um, learners from the most disadvantaged backgrounds are actually presenting with um, a, a really strong set of hires. Um, or, and, you know, that, and that is being recognised, for instance, through contextual admissions and through outreach programmes. So actually right, getting right down there into schools, so, you know, Edinburgh's Educated Pass programme, working with kids through football, um, to actually say, look, there are real opportunities for you at university, and there, uh, and, um, there are real opportunities for you to aspire to um, a highly selective um, university. So it's, it's, you know, e everyone has got examples of these programmes, um, and every um, institution, including the most selective, are now also um, looking at what more they can do on articulation. Um, to, to make sure that people have got pathways from college um, to the most selective universities. So there's, there's no lack of commitment. I think you know, there, there, is, there is an issue that um, if you are um, running a highly selective university or highly selective course, um, your pool of qualified candidates, even when you apply contextual admissions, is smaller than it is if, if you're running a course that, that is able to be less selective. Okay, uh, just to come back, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you were looking at the language of all that, and I suppose when, um, if I'm being cynical, if I hear that institutions are looking at something, it, it doesn't, it, it's a little bit woolly. What right. are they doing and when are they doing it? Uh, there's a lot of doing. I mean, there's a lot of doing of the actual programmes that are out there at the moment, um, trying to um, promote um, aspiration um, and realistic ach um, achievement. Um, to make sure that people are able to get into the most selective universities. In terms of the practicalities on the language, um, this, is not, this is being done now with um, the target of getting new language into um, the prospectuses that are published in spring 2019. Um, when you look at the language about admissions across universities, it's all accurate, but some of it isn't actually that learner friendly. Um, and so we've got a, a, a task group that is, is drawing on learner experience and also drawing on plain English campaign to say, how can we actually just get on and simplify this so that what we communicate to learners and advisors is actually comprehensible. It's, what they, it's what's understood by them rather than what seems appropriate from our perspective to, to communicate. So that's, that's, that's a project that's being done now. So that's about waiting for the print of a prospectus for the following year rather than... Uh, no, is well, that, am I picking you up wrong? That, 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 the, the, the next prospectus is that will be published are the ones that will be published in early 2019. And that's what will inform the next round, round of applications. Um, and we want to make sure that those prospectuses have got much clearer language um, about admissions processes, you know, picking up on the point that we've heard multiply from, from this committee and, and in many other places, that actually 
Um, while what we express may be accurate, it's not that easy to understand if you're a learner or their advisor. Ruth, I want to move on. Sorry, uh, yes, OK. If I move on to the equally safe strategy. As a, um, a toolkit, as a parent and a corporate parent, I was obviously delighted to see that launched. And um, uh, Professor Diamond mentioned about the importance of the first semester, and obviously that's there to tackle the... Um, unacceptable levels of harassment and, in some cases, abuse that have been happening to young women. Um, part of that toolkit is support information for students, um, and it mentions well-publicised support information for students. So how will you publicise it, and when will it be done? Will young women starting university um, this year receive that information? Answer yes. And the, you know, the big question is how? Um, and the sorts of things, again, there's no magic bullet here. So the sorts of things we will be doing will be um, information in halls of residence rooms. You know, when you arrive, you know, the set of leaflets that, that are there. Um, support in halls of residence when people arrive. Because most of our first year students do um, stay in halls. For those that don't, I'll come in a sec just a second. But you know, kind of the, the people there providing that early support through the whole of Freshers Week. Uh, providing that support through tutors being advised to, to raise the issue and make sure people are aware through our online uh, health and safety um, piece that students have to do in, in, in their first year and also through, if you like, outreach through the Students Association um, in, in, in early time. So with you know, there's no, no one answer, mm. but a multiple level of roles and a, with a real aim to make sure that no one falls through a crack. And is that mirrored across the institutions in Scotland, that, that approach? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I ask you, uh, Mr Sim, is it mirrored across the whole university sector? I mean, we've got uh, two principals here that say yeah. it is, but is it uh, Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the... The, the, the bar has been raised and quite rightly been raised um, in, in terms of expectation that we're, we're all effectively addressing this um, and the Strathclyde um, University Gender-Based Violence um, Toolkit um, is now um, part of the requirements through outcome agreements of, of what um, universities um, are, are expected to do to address gender-based violence. So it's, it's now being universalised across the sector, yes. Yeah, uh, I, I've got a constituency uh, interested in this as well, that Emily Drewitt's parents are, are constituents of mine. Um, can you assure me that at universities that every student will get a card or something that has got contact details to make sure that they know who they need to contact if anything happens, like happened during that dreadful case with, with young Emily? I could, we, we, we are working on that at the moment. Um, we, we're, we're developing the but text that for, a, for that a, card. A, is that a yes? I mean, no, we, yeah, quite, yeah, we're getting on with it, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a simple thing. Yes. Uh, and so you're guaranteeing to me that every student will be given a card with contact details for the police, social security, whoever, rape crisis, whoever it may need to be, they, they will get a card with the necessary details on that. Could, could, could I just check and write exactly? I mean, we, we've made a, a you know, very clear commitment, particularly for staff, that they're going to get um, a first responder card. We're working with NUS Scotland. I'd actually like to be able to, to, to write to you with the exact commitment that we've made rather than, than give you something that might be inaccurate. But we have worked very closely with um, Emily Drewitt's um, parents on this, and we are committed to addressing But I just don't want to give, tell you something no, no, that isn't no, absolutely and, explicitly and I accurate. That, but I, think, I, I do think it'd be a, a real hole in the system if what you're doing is you're giving a staff yeah. member details to, to know who to contact, but not giving the people who may well be first affected by it. So yeah. uh, I, I, I do appreciate and I'd appreciate if you come back to, as soon as you can yes, with, with the detail, Gillian, you wanted yeah. to come in on this. Up question, and I recognise this is a very sensitive area, and we've all been affected by what happened to Emily Drew. In the light of, of what happened there, um, will universities be looking at how they respond and <clears throat> the mechanisms that they may have in place uh, when dealing with the perpetrators of gender based violence? Um, because you have got power at your disposal to uh, make it clear to young men who perpetrate gender-based violence or anyone who perpetrates gender-based violence it will not be tolerated by an institution and that they may be looking at being thrown out of university. 
I, I think all universities have very clear disciplinary processes in place, uh, and gender-based violence, violence of any sort, uh, is very clearly articulated in all universities I've ever worked in, and I don't imagine any of my colleagues here or other institutions in Scotland don't have similar processes in place. Um, uh, rest assured, the university sector is absolutely committed to ensure that people feel safe, no matter what their background, their gender, their orientations, their, their ethnicity, um, when they come to study on universities. However, we are societies, and, and in societies sometimes things fall foul of what we would like. Mm. However, I can assure you that in my university, and I'm absolutely certain it's the same here, disciplinary actions will be taken against staff and or students who, who do the wrong thing. But will it be made clear from the get-go that it will not be tolerated and that will be a clear message going to all new students that gender-based violence will not be tolerated and the consequences of will be obvious to them? I, I don't know how to answer that question because there are a number of obligations that we have of students and staff when they come to a university um, and, and these are merely part of a package of expectations. Violence of any form is clearly one of those but so too are many other things, misappropriation, mm -hmm. uh, language and, and so on. So I think I'm cautious about saying yes to you on that because you're picking a very specific point. But all universities have a charter and a relationship with their student body which says these are the expectations we have of you, these are the expectations you should have of us. And I think within that, and back to the question which the, the chairman was asking, um, is, is similarly uh, a set of characteristics that we will make sure, we do make sure that every year new students joining the university have access to. Whether they read them or not and whether a yeah, card is, is the, the right issue. mechanisms yeah, to do it is a different matter and I'm not sure how we legislate for that. Can, can I just come back on this? Uh, and, and I accept completely what you say. What I'm saying is that there has to be something that, that is for the student, right? And it becomes their responsibility, not for a member of staff, but for the student. But, but the other thing is that uh, uh, if you're working closely on this, it has to be that at the end of it that the universities are saying that if there is some sort of evidence that there's been abuse and an abuser is known, that even if it's not got to the stage of criminal proceedings for the safety of the, of the student involved, then there must be a mechanism that says if we can't see enough to kick you out, we can still make sure that you are not taught within the university, that you're taught from home or distant learning or whatever, because there's no way that while something is going on that a victim should be having to face her abuser. And that has happened, and it should never happen in universities. And it certainly, I hope, will be something that comes out of, of these discussions that you're having just now. Uh, okay, thank you, Ruth. Are you finished? Right. The, very briefly, I'm going to bring in, in, in Mary, but just uh, one point, I think. We've talked about um, contextualised emissions, we've talked about uh, articulation, and there does seem to be a disparity between the way that universities are, are dealing with this. And it seems to be that disparity, to a great extent, is between, the, if you like, the moderns and the ancients. What are the ancients doing to, to make sure that they do? I mean, it's all right saying that, you know, more people want to go into a university, but surely they still get the same responsibility to society as the other universities do, like the, the West of Scotland. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to disagree with you there, Chair, if I may. And which part that they don't um, have the, a responsibility um, no, to no, society? No, 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 not at all. Um, we are doing everything we can. We do contextual admissions, and we have done for a long time. We take that very, very seriously. The point that I've already made uh, is that um, only 4.7% of uh, the postcodes in our catchment uh, are from um, disadvantaged areas, and the fact that last year over 5% of our entrants, even on those criteria came from those areas, I think one statement. I would also say that we have enormous numbers of other students from areas which, who are dis from disadvantaged backgrounds, from areas who do not come from those areas, and we have given them contextual admissions and all the support uh, I have talked about. And when I talk, look at other ancient universities, I think one of the big statements is that the principle of St. Andrews absolutely rose to the challenge of leading uh, one of our widening access um, for, and is doing everything she can to, to, to push St Andrews in that direction. So I, I think it's unfair with respect to say that the ancients are not taking this seriously. Uh, I didn't say they weren't taking it seriously. What I says is that the statistics show that they haven't got to where the, the, the other universities have and, and therefore there still is much more to be done. 
to, to level that playing field. I, I think we and, need and to me it's excuse me to me it suggests that we get plenty of students that want to come to our universities, so therefore it's easier for us not to. No, that's not the question. That's not the, not the case at all. Uh, I, I would submit. I do think there are some real aspiration issues, um, and I think it, you know that there is. I mean, let me give you an example. I was in a school in Torrey in, in Aberdeen, which is one of the poorer areas of Aberdeen, recently, um, and I gave a speech, and we were having a really nice conversation with um, S5, S6 pupils. Afterwards, and one young woman uh, came up to me and said, "You know, she really, really wanted to study law, but people from her school didn't go to the University of Aberdeen." I said, "That's you know," and and I said, "That's absolute rubbish." And I more or less took her to you know the University of Aberdeen. We have to get within the schools as well as the work that we do, so that in our target schools. Everybody thinks they can come to University of Aberdeen. We need to Professor make that Diamond, the norm. Professor don't, Diamond, don't take this personally. It was about I'm the ancients as, as a I whole, know. and I accept that there may well be special circumstances yeah. uh, around but Aberdeen. We, but we, I'm, I'm, I'm with geography. you. We've still got to make a journey, yeah. but at the same time, it is not just these universities, it's about the schools well, as well. It's, yeah, I accept that, but everybody has to go along. I mean, just, just, just speaking on behalf of the, the sector as a whole, including the ancients, I mean, I, you, you genuinely... Um, there's a very, very strong commitment um, from the ancients. Now, I mean, uh, I think um, it may be helpful if, if I mean, it, it's work that is being now, done now, picking up on what Ruth McGuire said. Um, there are a wide range of programmes, for instance, St Andrews have got, pro have got a specially tailored um, programme for people coming in from widening access backgrounds um, to physics and astronomy, um, so that, you know, you're not expected to to, to come with a level of attainment that very highly coached students may come with from um, from schools in very privileged areas. I mean, there's a lot of work being done, um, and I think it would be helpful if I wrote to the committee and just actually set out some of that work that, 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 that is being done. Um, and equally, um, there is work in hand now um, reviewing what all universities, including the ancients, are doing to promote articulation. But, um, but I, you know, coming back to, to a point I, I, I made in, in response to Ruth McGuire's question earlier, um, when you're dealing with um, the most selective courses, um, there is an additional level of challenge um, in, in widening access because, because of the typically um, lower average attainment levels um, of people coming from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. So, you know, it, it, it serious work is needed to help people to realise the full potential and to recognise that full potential when it's not fully um, evident from, from exam results. Um, and I do think that that poses an extra degree of challenge for, for the most selective courses. Well, it would be helpful to get that information, but also a sort of timetable and, and where you see you achieving uh, what you're hoping to set out to achieve, not just that you know, the universities are looking to it at some stage in the future. Uh, Professor Mahoney. I just wanted to pick up on the same point that you've just been uh, discussing and, and highlight the fact that uh, it's unfair to, to distinguish in the way you did. I think all universities, and, and we work together very closely, are doing the best they can to widen access. Um, and, and I think we also should be careful about trying to homogenise the system. Uh, the university system in Scotland is, in very, is a very successful system of higher education, recognised throughout the world and is very, very capable. And, and uh, you can look at my university and say, well, OK, how come you're not doing very much research? Uh, because we're not a research-led university. We're a teaching-led university with research, which is world-class, but it's small. And I think homogenising a system... And I'm know you're not saying that. Not I know, just saying hang, homogenize, no, but, homogenizing hang on. system. Can I just finish, though? But I know you weren't saying homogenisation, but that's the risk that we present by having this global argument saying you must all be at 20% minimum of MD20s. If you want to look at that, then I'm failing... Mm -hmm seriously widening access, because I've got no MD80 students. That's an uh, interesting take on that, but uh, nobody's saying that that's what you're looking for. What we're saying is every university should be within the grasp of every child that's, that, that, that can fulfil the qualifications. That All of us are committed to the fact that if a student wants to access higher education, we want to get them in. Well, let's hope that we, if we have a discussion here in a year or two years' time that we find that the statistics are, are much more equal than they are just now. Uh, Mary? Thank you, Convener. I have two um, brief questions, and I have a, a specific question for um, Susan Stewart. 
Um, my questions are around retention, and a lot of the issues that I wanted to raise have, have been covered. But I, I just wonder um, from the panel what analysis and follow up you do when a young person, particularly from SIMD 20, leaves university. Is there an opportunity for them to drop out and come back in? Is there an opportunity for them to change the way they learn for a period of time? Um, if, if they need to, to drop out to, to do something either with family or they have a, a particular issue. And, and you don't need to give me a huge amount of detail, but I would appreciate it if you have examples, if you could perhaps let the, the committee know, but maybe a, a yes or no or a very brief answer on that one would suffice. This is one that, that, that practitioners can give the most insight on, but maybe we could just give a bit of statistical background. Um, when, um, when we look at the statistics for um, people who, who, who discontinue courses, um, we do find that at least some of them are coming back, um, and uh, we've got about 15% come back into the same and institution. Do, do they come back in at the point on the left, yeah. or do they come back in at the start? I, I think typically at the point on the left, and about 11, well, about just, just under 12% are, are coming into different institutions. Now, you know, obviously, um, as, as Professor Rohn here said, some people who are leaving university are leaving because actually they've got a good job that they want to go and do, and that's, that's their choice. But I think yeah. we do need to take seriously making sure that if someone is, is, is stopping their studies for reasons that aren't really you know, mm -hmm. good reasons, is it, is it, is it because things just aren't working out for them, we need to, to, to engage with them and find out why and find out whether continuing in higher education is going to be the, you know, how, how we can best support them. But um, my, my colleagues who are practitioners will have more insight. Yeah. Okay. Can I? Come in on, can I come in on that? Scottish Funding Council funded OU to lead a project called Back on Course, uh, which, which worked with all universities in Scotland who, who participated uh, when, when people had left a course early. Uh, the report will be out in the summer, but three fun, uh, findings initially, uh, that collectively we need to do much more on advice and guidance when someone is starting university. Secondly, the early exit is not just a first year issue and, and happens subsequently too. And thirdly, and this is really important, I think, that the majority of students who leave early uh, would like to return to study in the future, not necessarily in the same course, it's often subject course has been the mistake, and not necessarily at the same institution. Um, so we will make sure that the committee get a copy yeah, of that report when it's out in the summer. Yeah. But at OU, of course, you know, learner yeah, journeys are not learning. linear. Yeah. You know, people do, I think, step out is a better phrase than yes, stop out. Stop, I'm not sure yeah. Commissioner would ever be in Glasgow when he talked about <laughs> stop now. <laughs> Yes, uh, we, we, we do have people return. We have bespoke learner agreements. We're lucky we're a small school with a lot of individual inputs, a, a major teacher, mm. uh, a center for voice instruction, someone that's teaching you dance. They can keep an eye on the students. So our retention rate is very good across across the whole sector, but we, we will allow someone to return. In, yeah, in, no, that, that would be helpful. Has there been um, any impact on the move from bursary to loans on students? particularly for SIMD 20. I'm not aware of evidence that has, that has particularly linked that to dropout, but um, I was on the, um, the panel that um, developed the, the proposals for, for an improved student support regime, and we realised that you know, financial stress is, you know, whether you link it to those specific policy changes or not, financial mm -hmm. stress um, is one of the, the, the key drivers of people um, discontinuing their studies. Um, and so we made a recommendation for a, a minimum um, quantified amount of, of money per year um, for students. Um, I think we're waiting for the Scottish Government to, to, to respond in full to that, because I think it raises some interesting issues about the junction with the, the, the benefit system that need teased out. But yes, I think at least making sure that students have got access to an adequate package um, of support um, even if it is based on a balance between bursary and loan, um, is important. Okay. And finally, my question yeah. for um, Susan Stewart. Um, the Open University, um, as, you, as you said a moment ago, because of the way people learn, they can drop in and drop out, they can, they can do a degree course over a, a much longer period of time. And there have been concerns raised um, in, in the last few months about financial constraints on U Open University across the UK. 
Um, is that something that's reflected in Scotland as well, or is there a different position in uh, Scotland? I mean, obviously, uniquely, the, the Open University has a footprint in all four nations of the UK, which gives economies of scale, etc., in terms of curriculum choice. Uh, the, the pattern north and south of the border is very, very different. Um, in Scotland, our student numbers have grown year on year since 2014, so much so, in fact, that we are now recruiting 27% more than, than our funded places, uh, which, which is, is interesting. In, in England, of course, there was a change in 2012 uh, to the model of higher education funding uh, and student support. And what happened was a disproportionate fall off in part-time numbers. In, in fact, David Willits, who was the minister, who was the architect of that policy, has gone on the record saying that he regrets that policy and that those uh, circumstances were, were unforeseen and that he regarded that as a mistake, that older students have more commitments, they have mortgages, they have work, etc., and tend to be more debt averse. Um, so student numbers have, have dropped uh, south of the border in the OU. We are, we are addressing that. You may have seen uh, media um, uh, reports on that. Uh, I am very confident that uh, curriculum choice for students in Scotland will be in no way restricted um, and that we will continue to provide a first class uh, experience for students in Scotland. We are, in fact, I think the only university in Scotland that in every year the National Student Survey has had over 90% student satisfaction and I intend to keep it that way. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. I've got Oliver lastly. Thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, student support and finance. Um, firstly, do you think that the current levels of student support are insufficient? I, I guess the answer is probably yes. Um, we know that students do experience challenges in their, in their learning journey, um, as is experienced not just in Scotland, but across the UK, and in fact in most modern higher education environments. So I'm sure anything that we can do to uh, improve that would be welcome. Um, I think simply, uh, I, I actually, Susan will no doubt wish to comment in part time, but I think at least, um, um, in terms of um, what we were able to do within limited time uh, on the panel on student support. For, for full-time students, we, we recommended that it should be an entitlement to um, 8,100 um, a year um, based on a combination of bursary and loan, um, which we thought would be a reasonable level of support. And also, there should, there should be special measures, for instance, for students who are estranged from their parents, so that you recognise circumstances of disadvantage that, 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 that aren't um, tackled by, by just normal entitlement. Can I, can I just say, obviously, we want parity of part-time, and I think that's especially important when looking at widening participation and widening access, because we know that a far higher proportion of disadvantaged students, whether it be students with disabilities, students SIMD20, etc., for a variety of reasons, choose to study part-time. So we very firmly believe that part-time should have parity with full-time in whatever maintenance, loan, bursary uh, system we come up with. No, I asked the question because obviously you've talked um, at various points about support that's on offer once students get to university. Um, but what worries me from conversations with, with young people in schools in, in my constituency is that they are making a decision on whether even to apply to university in the first place based on whether or not they believe it's financially uh, sustainable for them. And that, obviously, for those from more deprived backgrounds puts them off applying altogether. So there's a group of qualified people uh, who, who make the decision not to go. Do you think that that's a fair assessment? Um, you know, I, I'd certainly recognise that the reality of that, 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 that people are concerned about the debt they may accumulate um, for their, their maintenance while, while they're at university. I mean, that, that's the reality. Um, but but I think they, there's... They, they, they simply but, don't think that they can afford to live off yeah. of the money that's available? Um, uh, well, I think I'd say two things. One is, um, as a panel, um, we did recommend an amount of money that related to the national living wage um, that we thought was a fair amount of money for a, a student to, to, to live on. And secondly, I think um, there needs to be much better um, explanation of this as, as an income contingent repayment. Um, we recommend that there should be a reasonable threshold. I think we said 25,000, but it's since gone up to 25,000 in England. Uh, of, of income per year before you start repaying your student debt. And I think there needs to be much better explanation, um, possibly from, um, from SAS and the student loans company, that, that the, the loan element of what you take out for your maintenance 
um, is, is something that will be um, repayable at a reasonable rate over a long period um, um, and only on, uh, on, on your income above a certain threshold. I, I, I wish that were better understood um, because I don't think um, you know, the, the, the maintenance support regime need be an obstacle to people from challenged backgrounds going to university. Okay. Uh, Oliver, you wanted to come back now. Yeah, no, I first of all want to say I'm a huge supporter of the work the University of West Scotland do in Dumfries and think that it that works really well. Uh, but I just wondered, um, Professor Mahoney, from your experience, do you think there's an element of people uh, actively choosing to study at uh, your institution uh, in Dumfries and at other campuses because it allows them to to stay at home and in some cases they may, if there was a different finance available, either study at different University of West of Scotland campuses or um, at other institutions? I think that's a very good question and I, and I, I would probably say the answer is yes, broadly. Um, we know that students at UWS who are Scottish domiciled travel on average no more than 10 miles to come to any one of our campuses. Yes, we're recruiting therefore a large number of locally domiciled students. If they could afford to or had the access to a different university, they may choose that. Uh, and it relates perhaps to my earlier point that, that um, we have a diversity of HEIs in Scotland, 19 of them, who are all doing very, in my opinion, very good jobs in what they do. And, and certainly uh, working in a university and leading a university that I'm very proud of working in and very proud of what we achieve. However, uh, as a university that by newspaper ranking tables in the UK will be found toward the bottom rather than the top, there are perceptions which people have, some of which I'm sure are in this room, about what that means by comparison with a different university. So if I take the campus that you're referring to, the Crichton campus, the University of the West of Scotland is the largest provider of HE in Dumfries. However, most people know that the University of Glasgow has a footprint there. It's nowhere near the size of work that we do. And, and I think that just demonstrates what I'm trying to say here, and that is that UWS does a great job. It transforms people's lives. It gets people into employment uh, that they wouldn't have gotten into otherwise. And when we look at our alumni, which we're now exploring with some, uh, some depth and, and integrity, and, and it dates back um, uh, quite a number of years now, we've got over 70,000 graduates, many of whom are high net worth individuals who have gone on to fantastic things. It doesn't matter which university you go to. You've got to make the difference with that qualification yourself in your own life. And I'd like us to promote every institution in, in Scotland in the same way. OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Thank, well, th thank you then. Can I uh, thank the panel very much for their evidence this morning? Uh, it has been a very good session. And we will close the public session. Thank you very much for your attendance.